Hey, hey. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hello. Hello. What did you say? How Just are you? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Good to see you all. We're going to go right ahead and just get started. I'm Amy Pritchard, she, her pronouns, founder of Game Power, and I'm going to play the moderator role today. Um, our subject at hand is getting ready to launch. We've already done a couple panels today talking about um, whether we should launch uh, <laughs> Go, No, Go, and talking as well uh, about signature gathering. And so we're, today's panel is really from the perspective of we are going, um, but we haven't launched quite yet. Um, and all of you have a long history doing work on ballot measures. I'm excited for folks to hear from you. I'm not going to do formal introductions. I want you to do that for yourself. Just um, obviously say who you are, where you're from, and maybe a sentence or two about the context of which we invited you to here today. Um, and once you get around to that, I will come back and talk to y'all about some of the questions that we have. I'm going to start with you, Sarah, just because you're right there for me. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Flowers. I own a firm called 76 Words. We are a full strategy advertising, sorry, a full advertising firm doing television, digital, basically any place with a moving picture is where we advertise to voters. Uh, we do general strategy as well. I've worked in ballot initiatives for more than 20 years now, uh, 13 of those are 76 words, uh, 15 wins on reproductive health, uh, wins on minimum wage, on voter, voter rights in Florida and Michigan, um, a whole bunch of different kinds of stuff uh, across, including revenue measures across the country. And I was part of the original 2012 team that won marriage equality at the ballot, which I think is, was a start of a big wave of ballot <laughs> initiatives uh, that we've all, all participated in. I'll toss to Taryn, who's next to me. Great. Hi, um, I'm Taryn Rosencrantz. I'm she, her uh, pronouns. And um, I will say 13 must be the lucky number because um, New Blue Interactive, which is the firm that I'm the founder and CEO is. Um, I has been started for 13 years as well. And prior to that, I worked in <laughs> democratic politics um, for a long time for the DCCC um, for almost 10 years there. Um, but I will say, and other campaigns before that, but I've been working on ballot measures, I think, for most of the 13 years that we've been here off and on when things came up on the ballot. So we definitely um, have been doing different stuff. And we've worked in all 50 states. We do focus solely on digital, um, but we do do fundraising, um, you know, uh, rapid response response, strategic communications, digital advertising, um, and sort of run the gamut of anything that falls under that digital umbrella. Um, do you want me to, I will popcorn it over to Jake. Thanks, Darren. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jake levy Pollins. he, him, pronouns. I'm a partner at Trilogy Interactive, and we are a, uh, a digital firm that both has a uh, persuasion advertising uh, practice as well as what I like to call an owned media practice. And that's everything from organic social media, website development, uh, and email fundraising and email, email organizing. Uh, and we have a long, rich history of doing ballot measures as well, which I suppose is why we are all here uh, from legalizing marijuana in, um, in Montana, voting rights and ending gerrymandering in, in Michigan. Uh, we're California-based, so Gosh knows how many California ballot measures we've we've done, including and in the sale of flavored tobacco um, in the state just last last cycle. We also are, are known for sort of start setting up a uh, an e signature program that helped during the COVID. There's a lot of content right now about COVID being four years ago. I don't know if anyone else has seen that content. Uh, but when that was all happening, we set up an e signature program that helped ballot measures uh, stay afloat and continue to gather signatures even when um, the shutdown ended the ability to, to collect signatures in person. And I will popcorn it to Emily. Thanks. Hi, I'm Emily Gittleman, um, she, her pronouns. I'm a director of Uplift Campaigns, which is actually also a California-based firm, but we work uh, nationally. I run our Colorado shop. I'm based out of Denver. Um, so working for clients like Michael Bennett and the Colorado Democratic Party, but we also um, do a lot of Colorado ballot measures there, um, including the free school lunch one in the 2022 cycle. Um, we 
um, in the last year came off the no on issue one campaign in Ohio, the constitutional amendment initially, the one on the on the August ballot. Um, so Uplift does a lot of work um, on ballot measures in Colorado, California, Arizona. We have a big office there. Um, and then we pop into Ohio, North Dakota, um, all sorts of other states like that. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Gabby. Oh, and I'll, yeah, I'll punt it to Gabby. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Gabby Cardenas. She, her, AI pronouns. I am excited to be here in this space with our colleagues. And we are an Arizona firm that does work all over the nation. And right now we're currently working um, with my colleague, Sarah, on the Coloradans for um, Reproductive Justice. And we work with um, other, on other um, ballot initiatives, uh, particularly in Arizona, and just really uplifting the work. We're known for our progressive roots, and we um, particularly love working um, just to really um, center ourselves with uh, voters of color, and especially with an emphasis on women's um, reproductive justice. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, I also want to shout out just um, two of our partners in putting this program together. We've worked with Jess Cannon from Simple Majority and the Initiative Strategy Center. And we've all done a lot of work on these um, on initiatives all over the country and certainly learned a lot. I feel like I mean, I've worked on them for more years than I care to admit to. Um, and going back to some of the anti-gay stuff in the 90s. Um, but I feel like the last several cycles without being super specific have really um, taken a turn. Again, shout out to our friends at BISC and some other amazing uh, coalition folks and funders who have really realized that we can make an impact um, doing proactive initiatives and not just having to fight back at them. Um, all that is to say, you know, there are, um, they are very different than some of the candidate races folks are used to doing or party uh, campaigns and while I said, you know, we wanted to focus on post-qualification, the reality is even when we were um, talking about qualification, we didn't really talk about communications in qualification. So I want to dial back that comment and, you know, um, really just think about launching, right? Launching might actually be the signature gathering part too. Um, you know, I think um, ballot measure campaigns really come in phases that are different than some other campaigns. Um, and the communication aspect of it is really different. Um, so, but still knowing that this is just operationalizing in some way, the campaign, um, just talk about how you get started and also mindful you're all um, here as sort of consultants and longtime activists. But part of our goal here too is also to talk about how folks get engaged, um, maybe who haven't done this work before. Um, so just thinking about like the beginning of the campaign, whether it's qualified or it's just, you know, launching the signature gathering, um, how do you approach the very beginning of this process, beginning of the campaign itself? Can I start with you, Sarah, again? I can go in the same circle unless anyone really wants to jump in out of, in a different order and just nod or smile or raise your hand too, if you're like, I really have something important to say right now. Great. Well, in ballot initiatives, you have two things that you have to defend if you're on the yes side or two things that you can attack if you're on the no side, both the issue and the instrument. So for me, that comm strategy has to begin before you even think about getting on the ballot, because how you describe an issue has to be rooted in the emotional context of everything that else that's happening in an election. So I like to walk people campaigns through something very similar to the Paul Tolley message box. I'm sure most of us have seen, but the basically four, four, yes, no. What are the different arguments? What do we need people to feel? And who are the people we're ultimately going to need at the end of the day? One thing that can get overlooked uh, in the qualifying stage is for many of these ballot initiatives, particularly on the yes side, looking at something greater than 50%. So it's in Colorado right now, it's 55. In Florida, it's 60%. So making arguments at that scale means that we need to think about how an issue and the instrument itself might be received to voters before we get 
any kind of conversation because all different kinds of voters are going to have to end up on our, on our side at the end of the day. Some other things to kind of keep in mind at the beginning of a campaign is every tweet, every press mention can come back and be in an ad. It can be in a targeted ad and you may not know it, or it could be on a fancy TV ad and everybody will see it. So that's why it's important to start early and to train the entire team, everybody who's gonna be signature gathering on the core messages of the campaign. I think that goes to me then. Um, I, I couldn't agree with Sarah more. And I think it's really important, especially about the part about not letting things get away from you. I think kind of building on that, one of the things that I think also happens to folks at the beginning where it's a pitfall that we all want to avoid is that um, sometimes you get people on the ground, they're excited, maybe they <laughs> maybe they have a message that goes off track, but another thing that happens is that resources get spent too early on the wrong things. Um, and so I, I feel like we've come in and been the cleaner in situations where folks have maybe spent a lot of money trying to acquire lists, um, you know, getting messages out, it then turns out to be the wrong message. <laughs> Um, and you know, the ballot language is going to be totally different. It's not what we wanted to say. It's completely something that we've leaned into, um, and they've spent resources and money and time and effort that has gone and will go in a completely different direction. I also find sometimes when we do acquisition, they've maybe spent a lot of time trying to do something on the fundraising side that they think is going to raise them dollars and actually backfires. And then they've spent precious dollars. Um, so you really want to be, I think, the most important thing you can do is really be thoughtful about everything you're doing in those beginning stages, which means bringing together a smart and strategic team and really think about every step of the way, like what are we going to do at what phase and at what point? Um, and I think being patient a little bit, um, which is hard because everyone wants to run out at the gate and do as much as they can because it's exciting stuff and really realizing like, Let's build backwards from, you know, what stages and phases we need to be at and really think about what we need to do, because that launch is critically important and we don't want to mess it up and we don't want to spend the wrong resources, the wrong message at the wrong time. We really want to do this the right way, right from the beginning. Jake, do you want to agree? Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that. And the nice thing about being patient on ballot measures uh, is that you have this unique um, opportunity with ballot measures to have like multiple launches in a way that a, <laughs> uh, you know, a candidate race doesn't. And what I mean by that is when you launch your campaign to start to start signature collection, that's to qualify, that's hypothetically a launch. When you collect enough signatures uh, and you're qualified, that is hypothetically a launch. In a lot of states, uh, you won't actually get your ballot number or letter uh, until months after that into the summer. That could be a launch, right? So I think as Taryn said, patience is key because it's not like you have one chance to launch and then, you know, Godspeed to figure out another earned media moment. Uh, you're going to have other earned and owned media moments built in in a way that lots of campaigns would be, you know, would be desperate for. Um, that being said, a launch is a terrible thing to waste. So as much as I agree that you don't want to waste uh, resources, you really want to think about what you can get out of this. Um, a great social, you know, if you are hiring Taryn and you want to do a lot of fundraising, some earned media is going to be, probably be pretty important, something to give uh, the fundraising team uh, some energy. If you are trying to build a some grassroots energy to have volunteers for signature collection or just give your on the ground volunteers who are, who are already really fired up and need some somewhere to go, if you're trying to give them some social media, they're going to need something, um, something to do. Uh, and, and so really think about what you can get out of an earned media launch moment, I think is as critical as, as then it relates to all of the digital pieces, whether that's building a movement, having nice looking stuff for social media, the website, um, all of that. You should be thinking about your toolkit of digital uh, and earned media uh, and getting ready for, for what you can fill in from there. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said here, uh, specifically um, Taryn's point about doing everything well, as opposed to just moving as fast as possible. And especially like as a consultant, the instinct from the client side tends to be, let's just send an email right now. And um, our, our approach is if we do the right things now to build the foundation for this, it's going to pay off in the long term. It's just basically an investment. Um, in like the way that we're using our resources and our time just to make sure that we like 
do this right, that we're not just doing it. And I do think like, cause Uplift is split between like, we have a, you know, full ads program, but also online fundraising. So we get brought in a lot to do all of this. And I think with ballot measures, especially kind of flashier, splashier ones, there's this idea where it's like, all you have to do is get an email out and there will be dollars. But I mean, while that's true, there are certainly trade-offs. Um, and if we're doing it right and we're messaging it right, um, and really honing in, especially early on, on a simpler, really direct message that boils it down into its largest components. Um, it just helps everything in the long run. Gabby? Oop, oh, you're muted, Gabby. I, I do agree with all my colleagues and, and, you know, we are, all, all of us are an extension of the coalition and we do have to provide the tools. So as the digital um, partner, what we're doing is we are creating assets, toolkits, um, the intentionality is there. And also we have to think of all the voter blocks that are going to win that are going to help us win the ballot initiative. So when we are creating these assets, are we creating them and translating items um, appropriately for the, you know, for all the universes? And so that's what our role is right now, um, making sure that we are providing um, the toolkits. Are we um, providing organic pieces? Because the the coalition members are the biggest um, the biggest assets for us in these early stages. So this is what we need to do and we also have to be patient right we have to know that we're in the early stage and how do we also help fundraise so with the email campaigns and these these small campaigns that we have created with the launch the geofencing how do we also do retargeting and how are we creating these audiences so then when we do um the turn in the turn in um campaigns those campaigns are also, we are generating these audiences and they're building equity for the campaign. So it is part of the, that equity and that awareness, but they're small campaigns and it's creating that brand. So people are comfortable because we know that that yes makes people uncomfortable. So at the end, it's, it's building that forward equity. So our role is to be an extension of the coalition to understand that abortion is uncomfortable and building that brand early on is critical but we know that we cannot use a lot of resources so the small campaigns are important in maximizing the the small resources we have available you know i just want to add one thing to get what gabby said which i think is really important at launch time is search which is the workhorse of all things um in digital especially when you're trying to get out if you think about it like amy when you're saying launch and you're at the very beginning nobody knows anything about this yet <laughs> and so where do you want to be when people don't know anything about it is search so it's kind of the forgotten thing i, I see so many times when we are looking at media plans and you know we're like you need to have this from the very beginning, even a low level, um, so that when people are searching on the topic that you're there, that you're already putting out there, you're already responding, even if it's just a low level search campaign that's just constantly humming. Um, and it's so much a part of the persuasion from the very beginning and from launch day, that search is never gonna turn off. Um, and I think it just, like I said, I, I love that search is just my workhorse. That's what I call it. It's the workhorse of all media plans um, from the very first day one. Um, and it's something I really always usually mention as my like, what is the core element of your of your launch? And we don't want to ever forget about search. Um, it helps you in fundraising. It helps you in persuasion. And it really just kind of is that like secret <laughs> special sauce that people forget about. And that really isn't going to be something splashy um, and exciting. And it's never the, you know, <laughs> big shiny object, but it really does make a difference. Taryn, I'm going to steal a workhorse. <laughs> I'm going to steal a workhorse from you when I'm doing doing yeah. pitches about search from now on. Okay, I'm well, I'm going yeah, to. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a commission. Asterisk, Taryn. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll put in quotes. But, uh, no, and in seriousness, I'm I totally agree. <laughs> I always give credit where credit is due. Uh, and right, I couldn't agree more about search being critical, and it's gotten a lot more complicated yeah. uh, because yeah. you know. 
I, I, you can't just do that. <laughs> because Google no, becomes now forty percent. <laughs> well, so search itself on Google has become more complicated, which we can get into. And forty percent of Gen Zers don't search on Google; they search on TikTok, YouTube, and mm-hmm. YouTube. Uh, right? Uh, we can get into a whole long conversation about TikTok ad bans, but you can hire influencers even from uh, launch to make sure that when folks are searching you know, abortion access, Colorado, or open primaries, Montana, or whatever they're searching, that, uh, that, they, that, that they are still finding you. And that might mean hiring content creators or influencers, which is a whole other can of worms, but it's becoming an, if you actually care about talking to voters where they are, that's not just Google search anymore, right? That is TikTok, that is Instagram. Um, to some degree, that's YouTube for search. Um, and you have to think about that as well. You, you all never you need to search. <laughs> well, you just I've need... never searched on TikTok because I'm I am not a Gen Zer. <laughs> I will not identify. I didn't <laughs> but... know you could search on TikTok. Oh, yeah, no, so they... the, this, the data is really important to understand. I mean, we're talking about nearly the majority of you know folks under 30, not like they just we don't search on Google. Yeah, um, and search is just completely unrecognizable from like I mean, five years ago, you know, I wouldn't, it's not like it's unrecognizable from a a decade ago. It's like five years ago, three years ago. I mean, just because of, I guess it's really the, the TikTok because of COVID and TikTok and the rise, the meteoric rise of it. Like that's really what's changed the dynamic of where people are searching and their search habits and why it's important to meet people where they are. And that's what's changed this whole dynamic of it. Plus you had all the political bans, you know, four years ago, and that changed the dynamic of where people were searching for information and the disinformation. So it's just search really has become that much more important. And to Jake's point, that much more complicated. So it becomes this, as I said, that special sauce, but it's also sort of the, like, it's complicated and it it can't be overlooked. um, And many times it is. Yeah. So I have a follow-up on this point and a tangential follow-up to my own, which is (laughs) even more basic of like just naming the campaign, right? What are you naming it? thoughts about how you name it. Like I said, we spent some time talking about the whole go, no go and, you know, ballot Mm -hmm. language and all that, but just how important is the domain name? Um, My tangential, I'll jump ahead is like, never mind the fact that you then have to pivot it to a yes on number. Mm -hmm. And are you then rebranding when you get your ballot number, right? Which is a pretty unique thing. You know, it's not, I guess it's almost like our going from primary to general on a, on a candidate race, but uh, it is a weird, it's a, it's, it's, a, a, rebrand. Rebrand. <laughs> it's, it's a rebrand. That's like, we just have to own it at that because yeah. the moment you get a number, that is what your campaign is on. That's how yeah. voters are going to uh, understand what it is or this one. Oh, the minimum wage one they're never going to know your actual real name. And I think that's something that can be hard for coalitions to accept. We should put a lot of thought into these still. We should make sure they're, they're good messaging. Um, but at the end of the day, you're a number. Or in some states, a letter. I mean, when we are designing logos and websites for clients, we'll show them the sort of the vote yes on this issue, the slogan sort of logo. And then we'll show them as part of the initial logo mock-up and website mock-up, what it will look like when they have a, a number or a letter. Uh, because we, it's all, that's gonna be, that's gonna end up being, they're gonna spend more time thinking about their name, but what's gonna actually be more important, as Sarah said, is, is just, you are gonna be a number or a letter. Um, so we try to do both at the same time. So people are, we, so we force the conversation because gosh knows, especially early on that like naming your campaign thing is going to be, you know, it's the pre- like the whole coalition wants to say, uh, and anytime you are naming something by, you know, committee, you just know it's going to be like 13 words long. Um, and that does like the whole tweet is just like your handle. Um, and that's obviously a real challenge for the digital. Yeah. The other thing to remember about the length of your name is it goes in your disclaimer. So the longer mm-hmm. your name, the longer your disclaimer, um, and that, that can be a, quite an annoying thing, particularly in states where you still have to add the top five donors as well. I mean, I couldn't agree more. This goes to my first point, which is that you spend all this time and resource in the beginning, and then it all kind of gets thrown out the door when you get a number. And I think if you you surveyed everyone here who has a lot of experience with ballot initiatives, they probably couldn't tell you the name of most of their 
<laughs> like the actual name of the group. Like I'd be like, well, yeah, yes, on one, but not like, you know, but like, what's their actual name? I'd be like, well, they were for something. I don't, wait, what did that letter stand for? You know, it's like, cause it, at the end of the day, that name was so not important, but it becomes this thing at the beginning that people are hyper-focused on and, and maybe it's not so important. Um, making sure the keywords and elements are when people are searching are involved there. But you mentioned domain name, which is different. That to me is different. Like you said that and I was like, well, wait, that's a whole different thing because that's not your actual name, right? Like that's just making sure. It may or may not be. I don't yeah, know, and right? you that's just got to buy up every domain name in the in the world because they're cheap and just make sure that they're available so that when they're, you know, searching if they're like, oh, what is that domain name? It doesn't matter. They're just thinking about it, that they're kind of whatever they think of, it's going to land on you. Um, the, the spin the wheel and it lands on you. That's what you want. Like if they're just thinking about if it's on reproductive rights, you want them to be thinking about anything that has to do with abortion, <laughs> that if they're going to land on something, it's going to be your site. It's going to come back to you. It's going to redirect to your site. I would also add that as a consultant, sometimes people come to us and the names are already decided. And, mm -hmm. and so our responsibility is to just be sort of nimble and to, build something off of the name, whatever it is that um, still works for, you know, to all of the points made here, like is still um, boils down the main issue of the campaign, but also works on a disclaimer and we can have a logo and branding that's like, you know, sort of grabbing and engaging, even if it has 13 words in it. <laughs> Or 76 words, right? There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but. Um, what are some, I mean, again, what are some of the things that, I mean, you've already touched on a couple, but that you think are changing or evolving um, and maybe different looking at this cycle? A few words triggered me, but I don't want to feed the answer well, here. Jake and Taryn hit on the biggest thing that is happening, which is the bifurcation of media and where we reach people, which is also the bifurcation of attention and being able to manage both of those things, being able to make sure you're designing buys that reach people where they are and get the appropriate number of petitions in front of that person to a large enough audience, though. With all of the targeting and refining we can do, we still have to keep it in our minds that do we need 55% of the vote? Do we need 60% of the vote? That you're still going to need to reach a larger audience than the, than sometimes in program testing or scores might want you to narrow down to. Uh, so that's one thing. But the bifurcation of attention to me is the bigger challenge. With all of these mediums and platforms, voters are doing more things at once. So just psychologically getting their attention and getting some stickiness around your message is harder than ever. It is also harder, we, we know that there are multiple devices in households going at the same time. And these can be oftentimes way more devices than there are people living in the house. <laughs> so people are on their phones, they might have a tablet going too while they have a television on. And all of that means whatever your 76 words are, they've gotta have an emotional hook to them and the message needs to be conveyed quickly and, and with a lot of stickiness over and over and over again. They used to talk about the second screen phenomenon and I always joke there's like a seven screen phenomenon because I even like, I watch my 15 year old daughter and she's got so many things going on. I'm like, what could you possibly be paying attention to? Like, how are you absorbing any piece of information? It's like, it's just like so many noises going on. Well, and that's well, the thing that makes data challenging. So like- Yeah, you have no idea. There. And it's probably her on half those devices that yeah. you are trying to track, right? It's not me that you're trying, you, it's me you're trying to find, but it's, you know, it's somebody else in the house that is general. Well, making sure we also create, you know, that the creative is standing out in crowded spaces, not, you know, we have short attention spans, but we're going to be going into a crowded space. Mm -hmm. So our job is to make sure that we are doing the best on behalf of our client and maximizing our skill set and producing the best creative out there. And, mm -hmm. and the intentionality is always there. To Amy's point about branding, that's where brand becomes really important. And brand is not just mm -hmm. the color you pick, it's colors, it's font, it's feel, it's language. 
um, and making sure that that is a consistent thing across all of these mediums that have different articulations of a message perhaps, or different emotional constructions of your message, but keeping that constant thread is a, is a giant creative challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll divide this answer into sort of into two. In in the fall, the pers yeah, the, pers the the way the world of persuasion and mobilizing is changing. I mean, Sarah and everyone just just touched on it, but how you reach people, where you reach people, you know, all of the sort of the news that people maybe sort of kind of hear about the, the limitations that Apple put on Meta and targeting. It just means that if you're if you're you know research firm says, you know, it should all be one-on-one -on -one targeting, like all model. You're just not, you're only going to reach 40 to 60% of your audience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're, and I say this with love to my TV firm friends, if your TV firm says linear first, you should know that in most states, 50 to 70% of your audience is only on OTT or CTV and no longer watching on linear, right? So that's, I mean, it's how you find and then persuade your people is hard. This could be a, easily a five hour conversation, but just to take to take it back to the theme of this, of this specific conversation, owned media has gotten a lot harder, right? Because it's one thing to try to raise money for your ballot measure if it's not, if, it's, if you are fighting for, and it's still really hard, by the way, I don't want to make it sound even easy then, but if, if you're an odd year ballot measure, that's the sort of the, the national focus, Ohio's abortion fight last mm -hmm. cycle. That's, I mean, the camp, the team that did that fundraising still worked incredibly hard and did really good work, but it's a little easier than trying, like there's going to be five or six, you know, abortion ballot measures this cycle. There's going to be a number of gun safety, a number of marijuana, a number of anti-gerrymandering. It's incredibly hard to raise money. It's incredibly hard to get attention on social media anymore, right? Organic, there's all of the news about Meta uh, and TikTok, um, you know, making organic social media less and less part of, you know, their algorithm. And the, I mean, this is already true three years ago. It's more true now. So finding ways around that, how do you grab attention? How do you inspire people? Whether that's through small buys on search or influencers, or whether that's by finding some hook that feels unique. Uh, the game is just a lot more complicated now and bringing in a really, cre not just a really smart team, but a really creative team becomes, and a really, and a team that, that reflects the diversity of the electorate and the base you're talking to. Just all of those things that I think a lot of us have been talking about for years, uh, you just have to put an exclamation mark on it now. I'm curious, um, I mean, you're all media folks of one kind or another, but um, so you're all talking, at least it feels like I'm hearing a lot about persuasion right now. But when I think about launching, I, I usually think that the priority isn't necessarily voters. It's donors, it's volunteers, it's activists, it's acquisition of emails. And so just talk a little bit about that point. If like, how do you talk about bifurcating? You really do have like a campaign to persuade voters to win the election. But so much of the campaign is about generating enthusiasm around activists mm -hmm. and donors and volunteers. This is the earliest, hardest tension mm -hmm. because while, yes, we need to be saying the things that get us to raise money, we need to be saying the things that excite our people, we have to be careful that those things that we say don't later on isolate the, the persuadable voter that we're going to need. Because while these may exist in stages for us, they do mm -hmm. not exist in stages for voters and they certainly do not exist in stages for our opposition. And the challenge can be the people at the beginning of a campaign are your, your most committed, you're most excited if you're yes. And I'm assuming since we're talking about go, no go decisions, we're yes here. So you really have to balance that understanding of what are your vulnerabilities. And that's where pre-qualification polling is incredibly important. One thing that we do on almost all of my campaigns is message training based on that pre-qualification polling to anybody who might be a signature gatherer, anybody who's gonna certainly talk at an announcement event, um, anybody who might interface with the media in any way, shape or form, it, it really expanding that past who you think of as your traditional communications folks so that everybody has the power to answer the question, why are we doing this? And why is right now the important time to do it with this particular initiative? Yeah, 
And I'll say from a fundraising perspective, like one of the things I think that helps to separate church and state here a little bit um, is that you want to focus your messaging to avoid the pitfall that Sarah is saying. And one of the ways that we do, and, and again, I think we're like Emily, where we said we're a holistic digital firm. So we end up doing a lot of this for both sides is that we'll say, listen, what we want to do so we're not bothering the the voters over here who might be a bit more conservative <laughs> um you know in that we don't want to piss off or get in the wrong way in the wrong lane what we try to do is talk about why they're giving to a very transactional thing so we're talking about what they're funding and that's the way to stay in that lane so when you're thinking about this and you're thinking about launch and you're thinking about like how do i get this message to give a donor to give in a very difficult time when they have a lot of things they're triaging towards one of the things you can do is talk about what you could fund so you know we need to fund you know, these organizers to do the following, whether it's signature collection, right? Whether it's, but you get very specific um, in the in the actions that will need to be funded, not so that it's earmarked because you're gonna do a litany, a list of and this and more, <laughs> um, but that you're explaining what phases and what happens and what needs to be funded so that they're mm. understanding that their dollars will be put to work immediately to do those things as opposed to trying to message or get them riled up for an emotional reaction, because most ballot initiatives, the emotional reaction doesn't need to be explained to them. They're already emotional about it. So what I try to do is rise above that and get tactical because they're already like really fired up because Roe was overturned. We're clear on that, right? Like they're really fired up because guns are bad, right? Like they're really fired up about whatever it is that we want background checks, whatever it is that's our ballot initiative that we are fired up about, they're well aware of it. So, and they're really, especially if this is a yes, which we were talking about, right? So whatever the issue is, they're excited enough to get it on the ballot. So um, you don't need to message them to get them excited about giving money towards it. Tell them why you need the money to get to the yes. Though, and I would add all that content is always such a banger. Like people really do like to see that their money is going to something real and tangible that they can like kind of track back for sure. And I would say for building out an, like an email fundraising program from the jump in mm -hmm. for your closest friend, especially for a ballot measure, and especially in states where there's either no limit, like contribution limits, or they're just insanely high. Which is and we have to be in. I think there's one of the in any state. Yeah, and absolutely. That's what we have. Our our email program for even small donors are important. And we're we're nurturing those donors and and we're gonna continue to touch them. There has to be additional layers of those touch points because even if they're not donating dollars, they they could be out canvassing. Those are though that those are resources, people's time that is something val of value and and eventually they they will donate to the campaign. So for us, that's what's really important right now is creating those email um, those email campaigns to to give us twenty five dollars, twelve dollars, and we're looking at um, what is how those donations are coming in, and we're just even if, even if they're small donations, they are important for the campaign because they will come in eventually at a higher dollars. How do you yeah. recommend, oh, do you want to something? go ahead? Jim. I'll just say quickly along with, I mean, obviously giving the grassroots like outlets for their energy is so important because people have a lot of energy. They care about these issues in their states uh, and fundraising and grassroots fundraising is a key, is a key part of that for important and obvious reasons that like that were said. Uh, you know, the other thing is of course, again, it's, it's organic social media. I think there's like nothing worse as a consultant to spend like, hours and hours with a coalition table uh, working on a one page toolkit that then like gets <laughs> you three tweets. Um, on the other hand, as Sarah said, there's like risk in not giving people a bit of a script. And like the nice thing about a social media toolkit is it gives people something to say, it's on, you know, it's on message. Uh, most ballot measures are starting with zero followers on, you know, on social media, right? Because it's starting from scratch. May, you know, if you're super lucky, you can get a, previous similar campaign uh, to lend you their name and you can change the handle. Uh, 
but you know, getting some social media out of the base again, using a toolkit so they're on messages. Another way to do that, I just always warn campaigns to to try to limit the amount of time you spend on that because you will ultimately just bang your head on the on the desk if you spend too long and get too little uh, too little out of it. I still think there that doesn't mean there's not value though. I want to build on one thing Jake said, which is when we train people who are not our press people spokespeople. What you're trying to train around is where not to go, as opposed to limit you to just what you can say. And this is where you got to give room, and it's uncomfortable for many of us to give this idea of openness for how people are going to personalize it, how they're going to say things wrong. They might say choice when what we say is reproductive freedom, but that's just that is the world we live in, and we have to be able to be flexible and fluid with people who are not always you know, reading cross tabs or understand why. So pick out the big things and navigate people away from those bads and leave space for the rest. I also think like a good message is repeated and um, your email program and social media is a good place to start. And like people do pick up messages from those sources, especially when you're repeating the same concepts and ideas and like obviously you know going deeper into them and sharing different stories and different impacts but the broader message needs to be repeated and consistent so true. what are some of the things that um you know so many of you, again, have been doing this a long time, but what are some of the things that you think folks could consider when hiring firms like yourselves, right? I mean, we've all had to go through this process. Um, so what are some of the lessons you've learned and how it's not so much to differentiate yourself, though feel free to do that. But um, I'm more curious um, when you're advising people about hiring others, what are you recommending? I think the hardest thing is to recognize sooner is actually better some people can associate soon with money and my particular business model that is not how that works we do not operate on fees um that said having a team of people who are experienced with your issue and experienced winning in your state will allow you to build that paul tolly message box and the numeric strategy to marry it to about and allow you to shift a little and focus on voters that you may not immediately come to mind with the people who are most excited about getting something on the ballot. I would also say, bring a pollster on. Even if you don't plan on polling until you know way further down the line, you want a creative and you want a numbers person because they have to work like this. I would also say like somebody that really knows how to work with coalitions because there's so many stakeholders and there's so many voices that you do have to really be able to have somebody that has um, has that experience. They, uh, at the end, coalitions have voices, they wanna be heard and they do have a lot of stake and navigating with, with uh, coalitions could sometimes be a little bit challenging, but you do have to have that experience and you, you have to be also very nimble and, and, and agile to work and move really fast and understand that everybody does have a voice. I know the campaign manager usually sometimes works with the coalitions, but sometimes you as the partner, you are put in those spaces and you do have to listen to everybody because everybody does have a stake in it. And we all want to win and are, we're passionate because, you know, if if we wouldn't all be here if we weren't passionate. So just understanding that coalitions, um, there's different perspectives and different um, different ways of really speaking up. So just understanding that coalition building is really important. I also think that like, ahead, as you're Jay. hiring firms, the division of labor is more is maybe more complicated now. Than it used to be what is digital persuasion versus your linear firm and i'm sure i'm sure sarah and i could could go out on it right now but that that sometimes they overlap sometimes they sometimes don't sometimes they yeah. overlap. as a business <laughs> first practitioner i want to tell you to not just have your linear firm also do digital but of course there's there's linear firms that do digital incredibly well including 76 words so like how do you divide your <laughs> so how do you divide that but also then 
who is is your persuasion firm doing the website? Are you hiring someone on the ground to do social media? Are you going to hire a firm to do social media? Because the division of labor has gotten a lot more complicated. Yeah, as the one who does television here too, I would say there's about 30% of the time in which we do it all. And the rest of the time is a partnership of some regards. Yeah. And it is important to have uh, the collaboration between the digital. And like that is that is because you were selling the same brand at the end of the day and making sure that that thread that I mentioned earlier really can be pulled across all of these mediums, including mail, is why it makes sense to have everybody on board from the beginning. And, and making sure that that everybody is built in, rooted and built, building that strategy from the original, this is the number of voters we need, and this is the language arts that gets us to those voters. Right, I mean, that's why, you know, as you are hiring your firm, any good consultant, right, can sort of have a good conversation with the other firms to make yeah. sure that the division of labor feels right and equitable, but it does mean that like hiring a firm that feels like it's gonna be collaborative, that has the right vibes, um, I just think it's more important than ever. And I will say this somewhat cautiously as like the white dude on this panel, but hiring firms that reflect like the diversity of both the base you are working on and the electorate you're gonna end up talking to is, is like, I think I think it's been important since forever. I just think again, like as we are talking about all of these platforms that are incredibly unique, um, having a teams that reflect your your voters is, is so important. Um, and, you know, most RFPs we get give that, you know, say they care about that. And of course, in practice, um, as, firm, as firms are being hired, that sometimes happens and that sometimes not. Um, but I would encourage you to care a heck of a lot about it. Yeah, I, I agree with everything everyone said. That's what I was going to start to say before. I was like, everyone's making such good points. Um, we always frequently say, like, we're happy to swim in our lane or we can be the whole pool. And I think you do really want someone who can be agile enough to know when you need to do which one. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and you always want to have somebody who's going to be um, a clear enough communicator to know also when it's a good idea to say, um, you know, let's make sure that we're sitting down and having a very straightforward conversation to Jake's point about where there are missing gaps and, and we are not addressing them because we think the other person is doing them or where we are overlapping and both of us seem to assume that we're both doing it and we need to have that conversation um, as well as like where maybe we're getting differing directions from a coalition. I've had this happen so many times in valid initiatives and so we're not quite sure which way it's going and who is really the final decision maker and someone who can be the bridge that brings those people together and kind of connects and understands and makes sure that we come out with a clear communication and a clear directive. I've always thought was really important in hiring a firm because you want someone who is really just um, you know, not a peacemaker is the, is, it sounds a little too dramatic, but it is that somebody who's able to communicate clearly enough to kind of come together and bring people together to the table to discuss these things in a way that it's not acrimonious. It's actually feels symbiotic and holistic and everybody's like, oh, kumbaya, we can do this together as a team. Cause you do really, I think ballot initiatives more than anything tend to have a lot of people at the table. And so it really, really is important that everyone's voice is heard and that you are making sure that your consultants are working as a team and not in silos. Um, sometimes you can get away with it with candidates and campaigns and, you know, independent expenditures, you definitely get away with it. But um, you can't get away with it in a ballot initiative because you can't be siloed. It's just too um, important, especially because you may have a, a coalition so many times. So we really want to be together and we want to love that feeling where we know what each other are doing and that we're getting along and that everything. So I think that's really important. And I also think it's really important. Somebody mentioned um, the experience, uh, you know, with ballot initiatives within the state, um, within the geography, within the issue, um, within the background. I think those are all important, but also maybe sometimes working within the consulting team because of what I just talked about. So sometimes it's like, how well do you work with these other people? Have you worked with them before? So if someone's come in from the beginning um, or worked with some of these people, um, as we all know, this is kind of a small world of ballot initiatives, you kind of end up working together a lot. To put something practical to what Taryn said, for any managers out there, this is also why it's important to have Zooms with, or calls, old fashioned calls, with just your consultants and you as the campaign leadership and not in front of 
the entire committee or donors or people who <laughs> might need to be performing for, as opposed to like, we got to really like make the sausage in some of these calls too. And those, those do have to happen way before product or, or polls are being written. And I agree with all of these points. And I would just add, like, I think hiring a consultant who's willing to have harder conversations, like it's really easy, especially with a coalition or a committee and a lot of people involved to be yes men or women or they, anyone. Um, and it's a lot harder to say, no, I think this is the wrong move or, or more likely that it's just a gray area and it's worth having bigger conversations, but they're not going to be easy and they're going to be uncomfortable. And I think um, having like finding firms that are going to be honest and forthright about um, when things are going well and when they're not, and when you have to change tact. Like I do think, especially when it comes to media and paid media, like it's changing so quickly and it will change so fast from like if you launch your ads even as late as August and you're running through November, like the plan's going to change eight times between then, right? Um, and the only other thing I would add to that is just having an approval process. Um, it sounds really simple, but there's so many scenarios where there just isn't a main person to sign off or there isn't a main like one or two people. And the I think the mocha thing is very real. But even if that doesn't quite work with the committee or the structure, like knowing who is the final sign off on anything before it goes live so that you aren't just like in this purgatory for all time trying to get really simple things like um, you know, scripts and storyboards, like, or even just schedules and timing, like to get all of that kind of stuff approved. So many thoughts on all this. <laughs> um, I'm curious too. I mean, again, just back to the, well, related to actually what you just talked about, um, both of you actually, but about both having the separate calls and then also working together. I mean, advice for folks on that, that um, I, like on our last, one of our last sessions anyway, um, we're talking about how to get information from the field to the consultants, right? Like, and mm -hmm. how do you better collect the stories or collect, you know, um, what they're hearing at the doors, you know? Um, and I, can honestly say I feel like I've been part of a few campaigns that have done it okay, but I still think it's a hard process, and it feels like a process that shouldn't be that hard. Um, so thoughts or advice on that? So as the, the the production house on the on this call, we own a bunch of big fancy cameras. We're an RE shop. We have a bunch of Reds too. Like those are sixty seventy thousand dollar cameras. Everybody walks around with a with a good camera in their pocket. What your field chooses to tell you is so critical <laughs> and working with consultants who are willing to put in the time to review all, find the best stuff to say, all right, this is really good. Let's put some money behind just, and it's a little bit of money. It's never going to be the thing that like is your big splashy, but it is something that in these social places. So if somebody goes to YouTube to search about your campaign, there's something there for them to see. There's someone, there's a, maybe a neighbor or a friend even there for them to see. That's something to keep in mind. Anyone else on that one? Sarah's just so smart that there is nothing else for me. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked on, on one campaign, I would say, where it felt like this went really well and it nearly killed the research director for it <laughs> so well. Um, <laughs> And I think on a on a week to week basis, like not even everybody on staff or in the consultant team would have said that it was going well. I think <laughs> it's just one of those things that like is always going to be a challenge. And again, it probably sounds like an oversimplification, but like we just try to set up every single possible route of communication that any client um, or team will use and basically like meet them wherever they are. So we are the ones that have to be nimble, but they are the ones that can just, to Sarah's point, pull out their phone, record in an event and send something somewhere and we get it and take it and do something with it. Right. So like it's on us as consultants or even as like a campaign manager to be the nimble one um, and to be reactive almost, but simultaneously like trying to get people in the habit of, of, 
over communicating, over sharing, but just setting up the the channels for them to do that wherever they're comfortable with it. And sometimes we'll set up entire communication systems and then people don't use them. So like they don't even know what they want. We sort of have to be the ones that are like, hey, it seems like this other system might work better for you. <laughs> switch you over to slack or to signal or let's add signal channels or you know anything like that i've got three more things kind of pulling back to how are we getting big coalitions to function well together the first thing i think it's really important to know is the tension between having a campaign manager with robust experience and a gc that's oftentimes you have two people stepping on top of each other and that's not necessary if you have somebody who has less experience or your giant ass state like like california you're probably going to need both people and defining who owns relationships and just management of the coalition is going to be crucial. Second thing, celebrate the wins. This is something that Jess, the majority, does exceptionally well on her campaigns is making sure that the entire coalition knows, here's how we won this week. Here's the good stuff that happened because it's always, to Emily's point, really easy for a campaign in the grits of it to be able to say like, this isn't working. Well, lots of time it is, and, and you got to celebrate what's going well. And the final thing is know when it's right to bring in outside help. Uh, I was the GC on the Mississippi Defeat of Personhood in 2011, and that about, did a bunch of GC and big overall national strategy work around marriage. And in both of those situations, so incredibly emotionally resonant issues that had not been tackled pro properly, we brought in a psychologist to sit with people and have conversations. She was both clinical and social. So it, like we, we did some structural things and it helped with the messaging, but really it also helped everybody know we're all here for the same reason. And like, this is how we get to, 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 to good together. Um, and doing, doing the work of team building too. I guess that's four things. <laughs> Anyone else wanna add some lessons learned? Um, we're coming up on the hour here with just a few minutes. I wanna make sure that you've had a chance to impart all your wisdom. Um, <laughs> I know that we've all had so many campaigns where you're like, oh, I'm never gonna do this again. Um, and all I mean by that is that thing, that episode or that situation, you know, not so much never gonna do a campaign again. I didn't mean that, but yeah. you know. <laughs> Remember as human beings, we are programmed to the negative. Like that's what kept us getting from getting eaten in the wild. And that is why people are so down on Joe Biden right now, despite the economy doing well. It is a psychological thing to be negative. It's also why no initiatives have some advantage. So like you got to feed the positive in a campaign every day. Yeah, I just I like feel like that. there's so much lessons learned that we'd be here for like two more panels, which is why I was like, oh, Sarah's, Sarah's good. We're good. <laughs> Every uh, so a much to say, but I, I will say that one thing I think, you know, my original one is probably the biggest lesson learned that um, because I think it encompasses a lot, which is that patience, you know, because there are so many phases throughout a ballot initiative, much more so than a campaign, which has a lot of phases. But at the end of the day, like um, they're just so much more concrete where um, concrete examples in ballot initiatives where things just turn, you know, because um, they're just you have to do this, you have to do that um, in order to be able to really get to the finish line. And so um, I would say patience is probably the biggest lesson learned on all of them in any of the, race, uh, any of the initiatives we've done. I would agree on that. I would agree on that and not every ballot initiative hires early on, there's different faces and, and you know, and celebrate um, the wins. You know, I echo Sarah because we're on the same team. Um, Jessica does re really keep us up to date with, with the signature gather gathering, she's always keeping us up to date on on where we are with the signatures, and and those are big wins. We we have to get to turn in date. That if we don't if we don't get there, there is no there is no ballot initiative. So we that's that's the first big win, and so we have to celebrate that. Those where are we at with signature signature gathering and. And so we we have to work together in 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 as a collaborative, and we have to stick together and support each other. Yeah, and my final thought is just like for all of the additional complications we talked about, this like modern era means there's so many more ways to to tell your story as a campaign and to organize your community, and that's like politics is about talking to people where they are and the improvement of people's lives. Like we get to do that in such cool and unique ways now than even 
four years ago, much less 10. Um, and it's really something worth celebrating and being excited about. Emily, did you want to get a last thought in? I guess just building on what everyone else has said is like we could, any of us could start on a campaign tomorrow and all of these things could be for naught. I mean, most like the, there are some big concepts that will like say the same, but like <laughs> every campaign team is different. Every approach is different. And um, I do find that like in this work, I still end up in, in moments where I'm like, oh, I'm surprised that that did well or that that didn't do well or you know this is all really hard to predict and so it's just a question of like being flexible and being um as predictive as you can but reactive whenever you have to be and not spending too much time worrying about being too reactive like everything changes a million miles an hour especially because of the media landscape and and the political landscape that we live in right now and so i think just being flexible and being open to um, things might not feel good, but it doesn't mean it's not going well. Great. Right. Well, we're just officially past the hour. I don't want to impose any more of your time, but I'm so grateful for mm -hmm. you all making time. And um, it's always a fun topic just to reminisce a little bit too, of like, oh, remember that. <laughs> so really appreciate you being here. Grateful for everything you do and hope to see you all at Bisca Road Ahead. <laughs> Um, or AV or somewhere in the near future, one of the various <laughs> events where you actually get to see people in person. Great. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Bye, Thanks, guys. Thank you. We'll see you all. Bye. Thanks. Bye.